All right. Um, my name is Stefan Thomas. Um, this is Evan Schwartz. Uh, we're the co-authors of the Intelligent White Paper. And uh, we're going to start today by uh, giving a quick overview of the protocol. Now, I think a lot of you might already be familiar with this, and so we kind of condensed it down to um, really the essentials. So it, it'll be a, a, just a quick kind of introduction um, uh, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it yet. Okay. So why are we all here? It's uh, this idea that um, we could make a protocol to connect different networks together. But first, um, let's explain what the problem is that we're trying to solve. A lot of people, when I talk to them and I say I work in payments, they seem to say, they seem to say that you know, payments actually work pretty great for me. You know, I can send money to my friends on, on PayPal, or I can uh, swipe my card and everything just works. Um, and that's true as long as you're not trying to go across payment networks. So um, I think a lot of times on the web when you're uh, browsing the countries or if you're living in a country that doesn't have a, a high distribution of credit cards, um, the payments experience is a lot more painful. Um, and it has to do with the fact that if you're trying to cross ledgers, um, that's the hard part, right? If you, have, if you just have different balances on the same system, it's very easy to increase one and decrease the other. Um, and you have one protocol that you're talking to the other person. Uh, so for example, if you swipe your visa card, there's some uh, EMV visa um, protocol that's being uh, uh, instantiated um, that allows you to make that payment very easily. Um, but if I try to uh, swipe my visa card with a merchant that only accepts MasterCard, um, it's a very different problem. It's a completely different ball game. And so um, a lot of people have tried to um, bring everyone onto one ledger. And I think kind of Visa is the furthest ahead with that. It just has the, the widest distribution. Um, you know, PayPal has a slightly different approach. More recent a, a, attempts have been Bitcoin, um, Ripple. Um, and uh, they, what they all have in common is they're trying to get everyone onto one ledger so that it's very easy to adjust balances between anyone in the world because they're all on this one ledger. Um, but there's one issue which um, is up here, which is it's just very hard to get everyone to agree on what kind of ledger that everybody should use. And, um, some people want the distributed ledger, other people want the ledger that's really fast or really scalable and don't really care that much about the distribution. Uh, some people want the ledger that can support any currency, some people want that currency that's, that's built in to have certain characteristics. Um, and so it's very hard to please everybody because there's so many decisions that you have to make when you're designing a ledger. Um, and that's why we've come to a conclusion or why we think that um, this will just never happen. We just have to face the reality that the people will never agree to use one ledger for the entire world. And what's the next best thing? What is the uh, thing that we can still do? Well, it's kind of similar to what the web has done, which is rather than try to get everyone's information onto one server or one database, um, uh, just make a protocol that makes it very easy to exchange that information, right? So rather than everyone coming onto one ledger and everyone using that one ledger, um, we can come up with a protocol that allows us to make payments across ledgers very easily. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with, with Intelligent. All right, now I have the fun job of quick, very quickly explaining how it works. How many people have already seen a presentation about how Intelligent works? All right, we got a fair, fair number. So, um, so the basic building block that we're talking about are, are ledgers. Ledgers, when we talk about them, are any system that tracks accounts and balances. Um, this could be based on currency, so this could be a PayPal or Visa or Bitcoin, like Stefan was mentioning. This could be non-financial assets, kind of anything. Um, it could be titles, to, uh, deeds, and things like that. Um, anything that could be tracked on a digital system and transferred from one account to the other. So payments are easy when, when everyone's on the same accounting system. And the problem, as Stefan mentioned before, is that not everyone is on, a, on the same accounting system. Um, so we introduced this, this concept called a connector. And a connector is just um, some party that can relay assets or money between different systems. Um, and so they have, uh, we talk about connectors in a kind of general sense, but the connector could be run by any party. It could be run by the same party as one of the ledgers, a third party, et cetera. Um, and the key point is that the connector has accounts on both of the ledgers. And so it can accept money into one and pay out money on the other. And the obvious problem that we have to solve is what happens if the connector drops it or runs away with it. Um, when you do um, this, these sort of uh, multi-system payments today, you kind of have a blind handoff where the sender sends the money to the next party in the chain. and there's no technical guarantee that the money will actually continue on. So if the connector drops it, money would, would obviously be lost. So the sender sends the money to the connector, 
and it disappears. They don't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't get through. Um, so what we use is we use escrow to provide security. And so the way that works is we have the, the ledgers themselves provide escrow. So that's kind of the core building block of interledger is that um, rather than sometimes when you think about escrow services, that might be a third party. Um, with interledger, we're really going for a system where the ledgers themselves, um, na either natively or sort of built on, would provide this escrow. Um, and so um, the w way it works is that funds are escrowed going from uh, left to right, um, meaning that the sender will put money into escrow first. Um, so the first thing that happens is the sender puts money into escrow. This e the escrow says, um, like, you'll either get this money back or the recipient will have gotten paid. Um, the connector sees that money is in escrow. They don't trust the sender, but they're like, okay, I trust this bank that I have, a bank or ledger that I have an account with, uh, I'll put money into escrow. So at this point, the um, everybody's got money in escrow. It's all sort of waiting to go. Um, and then transfers are executed from right to left. Uh, and the reason is this. So we have this concept of a, of a receipt where the, the recipient is signing something that says, uh, I've gotten this money. And as soon as they do that, the money that's waiting for them in escrow on their ledger is unlocked. So they, they get paid like that. Um, so the, rece the receipt uh, releases the funds from escrow. Sorry, I'm running through this very quickly. If people have questions about it, you can ask afterwards. Um, so then now what we've got is the connector has actually paid out money but hasn't gotten paid back. So the question is, how do they get reimbursed? Um, and the answer is that they get the same receipt from the ledger, um, from one of their ledgers, and they pass it on. Um, and that triggers the execution of the other, of the other payment. Um, and at this point, the payment is complete. Everybody's happy. The connector's gotten paid. The recipient's gotten paid. Um, and so in, in summary of that, um, really, really quickly, just the kind of high level view is that uh, in the interledger universal mode, um, transfers are escrowed from left to right and executed from right to left. So that's a quick overview of the protocol and how it works technically. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about what this gives us, because if you just look at this very simple example, um, that's perhaps not be not that interesting. Um, but what it is is it's kind of a it's a path. It's a short path between two ledgers, and based on the way the protocol works, it's kind of this iterative thing. So we can actually um, extend this path, and we can do more hops just using the same exact principles of forward preparation and uh, reverse execution. Um, and so if we do that, we can have a longer path and more hops. So again, you see the connectors, you see the ledgers, they always alternate. Um, and we can string as long of a path together as we want. Um, the longer the path gets, eventually your latency will go up. Um, but fortunately, the, the way that graphs work, um, they don't actually have to be very long to be quite universal. And I'm kind of already giving away the, the secret, which is um, if you can build long relay payments, if you can relay things over um, long distances, that means you can build a, a graph of things, okay? Um, and so basically what we're saying is that um, given this protocol, um, a system could be built which very much like the internet routes information, routes funds, okay? Um, just by stringing together this very simple principle into longer chains um, and then creating these relationships between um, ledgers and connectors in order to provide liquidity. And what that means is that now, if a new system wants to, to join and you want to create a new wallet, you want to create a new card network, you want to create a new uh, cryptocurrency, um, basically all you need to do is you need to create your ledger and you need to find anyone in the system that you can peer with. And if you can create liquidity with any other component of the system, that means you're now tied into this network and you, there's some path between you and, and any other point in this network. Um, once again, the, the idea is that that really opens up the, the system such that um, you know anyone can have the same reach that, like, let's say, a Visa has. You know, or if I'm a cryptocurrency, I can have the same reach that, let's say, a Bitcoin has. Um, and I, we think what we think that this will do is really create a, a fundamentally different kind of competition where um, you know if anyone has that network effect right away and anyone has that reach right away, you can really innovate on the features of that ledger. So if you want a ledger that's completely anonymous, if you want a ledger that is um, very scalable or very fast or whatever you want to do, 
um, you can now do that and still have that reach into um, uh, many, many, many systems around the world. Um, secondly, um, because it's just a protocol, and really the description that Evan gave is mostly it. You know, like you have um, you have to have certain escrow semantics for the ledgers that the ledgers have to adhere to. Um, there will be a little bit more uh, on that later today, but um, that's really the only thing that needs to be standardized across the whole system. You don't have to standardize um, all the aspects of how to come to consensus or how the, there's a currency that's being distributed or uh, any of those things, right? So the, the amount, the, the surface area of standardization is much less. Um, and as such, it's much more neutral. So for example, there's no holders of interledger coins that could get rich, or there's no, um, there's no uh, particular system operator that's taking a fee that everyone has to go through, et cetera. It's really just a protocol. And that was what we're ultimately after. Um, and then finally, um, it's quite flexible. It's quite universal. And what we mean by that is that uh, it can support any currency, as I mentioned, like anything that you can track on a ledger, you can essentially apply these principles to. Um, and you even can enrich very different kinds of systems. So I've been mentioning cryptocurrencies a lot, and I've been mentioning some traditional financial systems. And what Interledger is really nice about is, um, since the connector is the only thing that really needs to talk to two different ledgers, um, as long as the connector has um, the adapters for both, then they can talk to different protocols. So for example, they could be talking to PayPal's API on one side and talking to the Bitcoin protocol on the other side. Um, and it would be just fine. And, and so you can have ledgers that use completely different protocols, completely different stacks, approaches, et cetera. Um, as long as there is this one common element, which is the escrow, um, it will still work just fine. Um, of course, this system knows no, no borders uh, because it's online. Um, and yeah, you can use any currency um, and anyone can use it. So with that, I'll hand it off to Alan to give it a quick demo. All right, apologies for those that have seen this demo before, but. Um, There'll be new demos later. Yeah. Um, so what I'm what I'm showing here is a. Um, um, what I'm showing here is like a mini uh, a mini interledger. So um, each of these circles they're, right now they're a little bit bleached out. Sorry about that. Um, uh, each of these circles represents a ledger or a payment system, and so any one of them could be. Um, could be Bitcoin, could be any, any of these that we've been mentioning. Um, and all the lines between them represent the connectors that are connecting them. Um, and so what I'm, all I'm going to show is I can just click on any one of these and click on another one, and the, the system will automatically um, do a path find. This is a very naive path finding algorithm because it's a small small graph just running on my laptop. Uh, but these are the, act these are the actual components running. Um, and so it'll, it'll go and do a path find, um, and then what it will do is um, it moves quite quickly, so I'll actually slow it down because it's not that interesting to explain if it goes too quick, um, which is a good problem to have, I think. But um, uh, so what it's going to what it shows is when the bubbles turn orange, um, that's when money is escrowed. So that's the that's the escrow going forward, and then when they turn green going going back, that's money. Uh, that's the pay payment being executed. Um, so. So that's it. I hope you can see that okay. So just do so we can sort the, the whole idea with this is to show that if we have this very simple principle at play, um, it will be totally trivial to send from any ledger to any other ledger. Whereas right now, when you want to do payments, you have to be on the same system and you have to do this kind of negotiation of like, you know, I want to pay you. Do you have uh, do you have PayPal? No, you don't have PayPal. Do you have this other thing? No, you don't have this other thing. And then there, it's actually possible for you to just be stumped, where there is no system in common, and then you're kind of um, out of luck. And so what, what we're looking to have happen is a world much more like the way you send email today, is you don't do this negotiation of like, do you have Gmail? It, there's, there's none of that like having to be on the same system. And so that's, that's the sort of experience that we we think is possible and would like to see with, um, with this.